This is our third and final part. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the building. I could. I'm not doing that. That's why I made the video. Watch the video. Stuff's happening. We thought it was Monday. They turned up on Friday. It's already go. But I want to just talk or do the third and final part of the series that we've been walking through called The, the Price. And we've talk, been talking about the fact that there, there is a cost to following Christ. There is a cost to following Christ, and Jesus told us to, to count it. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verses 27 and 28, he said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, he said he cannot be my disciple. He cannot. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. And then goes on to talk about plans or military plans, or if you're considering battle, battle who, who, would, who would go to battle without first considering, if you like, the cost of that, when, when, whether we can get through it. So to truly follow Christ, there, there is a cost and a cross to be it, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would, if you like, follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I talked to somebody after the service last week. Well, I talked to more than just one person, but I, but I talked to someone last week after the service, and they were basically saying, Pastor, Man, these are some hard words. I mean, these are, these are some difficult words. And, you know, I get it. I, 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 I understand that. I, I, I get it when we, when we read and preach stuff like count the cost or take up your cross or deny yourself. These, these are, especially in today's culture, these are challenging and, and difficult passages to grasp, let alone live out. Well, they mess with us. Because we're like, what do we do with that? Because sometimes we just, we just feel we don't meet the mark. We, don't, we, come, we fall short. It's like, what, what, what do we do with this? So, so they're difficult passages. They're difficult to understand, difficult to live out. I saw this meme on my Instagram feed this week. And uh, uh, if you can put that uh, up there, I saw this meme, and it says, uh, one day English will kill us. And you can see the sign there is, crocodiles do not swim here. So you can jump in, you get, get ready, <laughs> go on, enjoy the river, crocodiles do not swim here. Uh, when I saw that little passage, when you read a sign like that, you, you realize grammar matters. Those little dots called full stops or ex exclamation, yes, those ones. They are important, and in this case, they could mean the difference between life and death. And of course, it should read for those who perhaps haven't figured it out yet something like this Crocodiles, do not swim here. That's what it should read. So these, these small things make a Difference, and when I saw this meme, that scripture immediately popped into mind where Jesus said, For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And I was reminded when, of course, when it comes to the word of God, Every dot, every iota, every, another version says, every stroke of the pen matters. As followers of Jesus, the truth is we, we can't, like lollies, just pick and mix. We can't, like with lollies, just pick and mix the, the word, take the bits we, we like and disregard the bits that we don't. We 
we can't ignore or even, as some are doing, remove what we don't like or perhaps don't agree with or those parts that make us uncomfortable. Because in a way, that's what the Word of God's purpose purpose is. It's like two sides of the same coin. It, it comforts the disturbed, but it also disturbs the comfortable. Hebrews, of course, calls it, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it, it talks about it like a two-edged edged sword. Of course, there are, we love the verses that will encourage and strengthen and, and, and build, but there's also the other edge of the sword which cuts and pierces and And penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges, it says, the word of God judges the, the, the thoughts and attitudes. And I don't know about you, but I, sometimes I have some stink attitudes. And the word or the, the, the tough things that Jesus says, judge the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It cuts both ways. We can't have one without the other. Second Timothy 3, verse 16, we know all Scripture, not just the bits we like. All Scripture, even the bits that make us uncomfortable, is God-breathed and is useful. You've got to understand, when we hear the, it, it's useful to us. It's useful to our soul. It's useful to our heart. It's useful to our mind. All Scripture, not just some, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for, for, for what? For teaching and for rebuking. Yes, there's some places where God rebukes us. For correcting and, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God, you and I, may be not partially equipped, but thoroughly Equipped. If we take only the nice verses and the up and you're going to be blessed. and you know, Friends, you, you, you're not thoroughly. See, already one person's walking out. <laughs> He's the leader. <laughs> thoroughly equipped for every good work. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Not one dot, jot, or one iota is insignificant. In fact, Jesus said this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so, of course, what we've got to do when we, when we read hard things or difficult passages, we must wrestle with them. We must engage with them. We must not ignore or avoid or, worse still, remove. We must let them do their deep work in and through us. That's a good place to say amen to this lonely preacher up here who's trying to preach his vow. I mean, it's just, we, we must let... The Word of God do its deep work in us. In the same passage in Luke chapter 14 that I, I shared just before, where Jesus speaks of counting the cost, if you read the whole, the whole actual passage, the whole context of that passage, to be honest, is at first glance pretty radical and, and even, I would say, shocking, especially to the culture today. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25, here's how it goes. It says, now great crowds, great crowds. There was, there was massive crowds following behind Jesus wherever he went. It says, now great crowds accompanied him. And Jesus, as he noticed it, he turned around and said to them. Here's what he said in Luke chapter 14. We're still in Luke chapter 14. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He can't. 
The next verse, which we've already read, read out, but I'll read again. Whoever, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, here it is again, second time, cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Then he wraps it up in verse 33. He says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce, in the NIV it says, give up everything. Anyone of you who, do, who does not renounce all that he has. I say to young people, someone say, Lord, I'll give you all that I have. You don't have anything. But as you get older, you get more. How many know you've got way too much stuff in that garage? Get it out. Come on. But the older you get, you realize, man, I, I, I have a lot of stuff. All that he has. Here, here it is the third time. Cannot be my disciple. And I know some of you, if you're new to the Bible, you might be, be going, Pastor, are you kidding? Hate my my dad, my dad's sitting over there. I don't hate him. He's rather nice. My mother's sitting over there. Love her. I don't hate pa Pastor. You're saying, hate my dad, hate my mum. Really? Is that what you mean, Jesus? Okay, I get it. My sister, yes, okay, because she's really annoying. <laughs> I get it. I can, I can understand that, but really? <laughs> My wife just said, don't you mention the what? It's like, <laughs> long night on the couch. But really, where to hate? Uh, that's a, never entered my mind, honey. You just got to know. Really, where to, where to hate? And I think it's important, especially if you're new to the Bible here to, today, that, that, that we unpack this a little. So what was, because what Jesus said was, was meant to get a reaction. There's no doubt, uh, there's no doubt about it. He, what, what, he, what he said was meant to give a reaction, but we do need to understand it was hyperbole. Hyperbole, if you don't know, is used uh, often in Scripture or in speech or whatever to kind of overemphasize something, exaggerate something to, to if you like, evoke a very strong response or feeling around the subject that's what it what it does and so that's what Jesus was trying to uh, achieve there what Jesus said was, was meant to get a reaction from the ginormous crowd that had gathered and was following along and of course this is not new to the gospel writings Jesus does this a number of times I, I can uh, one of the easiest ones in Matthew, you can, if your right eye causes you to sin, what does he tell us to do? Pluck it out. It's like, oh, that's a little extra. Uh, but he's, he's, don't pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it. Cut it. It's hyperbole. It's, 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 it's meant to exaggerate, to bring a strong response to the seriousness of of sin and now our, our action towards it, hyperbole. But the reality is in this passage, Jesus pulls no punches here. Uh, Jesus understood the great crowd that was, was following him. And, you know, so some, some people might, look, did you see how many were at the crowd last week? It was just awesome. Love it. You know, when we did open heaven, I was glad that Michael Fowler Center was full. Did you see the crowd coming? Jesus, that's not how he rolls. Yo, yo. Jesus, see, Jesus understood the, the great crowd that was following him, were perhaps following him, motivated for what he could do for them, give to them. See, people follow Jesus, not here, but... People follow Jesus for all kinds of reason. Uh, we've said, you know, sometimes we, 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 when do we call out on Jesus? We treat him like a lawyer because we're in, we're in trouble. I need a lawyer.
I'm saying don't be a meanie. Don't treat him like a genie. If I can, if I can just get something. So these crowds that his reputation was proceeding, and so they're, they're following him. They're seeking his, is that old saying, you seek his hand but not his face. What he can do for you. And, and so Jesus' words here were seemingly harsh, but they were meant to, if you like, separate the wheat from the chaff. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus does this kind of thing all, all the time. The, the, Jesus tells one young man, come follow me. And he says, yes, I, I'll come follow you. First, let me bury my father. And he says, let the dead bury the dead. You come follow me. It's just like, whoa. Oh, what about the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18? The rich young ruler comes to him, and I don't have time to read all of the passage out, but he basically goes, Master, what, what is the way to eternal life? And Jesus answers him and says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, love God, blah, blah, blah. You, 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 you know all the commandments, and he, say, he says, I have done all these things since I was a boy. And I can imagine the disciples, here comes this rich young ruler going, hey, look who's here. He can help us with the building program. <laughs> Why? Well, he's, he's the things my, most churches would love, most businesses would love. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. He had two million followers on Instagram. I just want to tell you, he was famous. So the disciples, if they had seen him come in, would have gone, whoo, he's here. And of course, he says to Jesus, I've done all these things since I was a boy. And Jesus is like, one thing you, you lack. He says, sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. It says, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich and he walked away and as we know jesus then said hang on i was just joking no he didn't <laughs> some of you are like oh did he no <laughs> I need to get in your word more please that's why we're trying to help you <laughs> if you're like oh whoo phew no no jesus let him walk away he didn't, didn't chase him didn't follow didn't go hey come back i was just kidding let's lighten the load a bit give half of what you know jesus starts this kind of Thing. Well, well, he, he calls men, men, to count the cost. So yes, Jesus' words were seemingly harsh, using words like hate, but, but like I said, he intentionally meant to separate the wheat from the chaff in this great crowd of people, to actually challenge them to really count the cost of following him. The great F.B. Meyer in his devotional commentary of the Bible explains these passages that we've just read out in this way. He says, here we have the Lord's use of the winnowing fan. The winnowing fan is just that when the wheat is thrown up, they would fan so the chaff would blow away and the wheat would remain. Here we have our Lord's use of the winnowing fan. Amid the teeming crowds, Jesus knew that there were many light and superficial souls who had not realized the cost involved in discipleship. Oh, if he would blow his fan over our lives. Thrice, three times in this small passage, Jesus' words, cannot be my disciple, are said. My explains, or goes on to explain what Jesus was calling the crowd to. He was basically saying, our, our love, your, your love. He, he was speaking this again to this great crowd of people. It wasn't just to the disciples. It was to his great crowd following him. He said, our love must be greater than the ties of our family affection. Must be greater than our love for our own way, our own life, which must be nailed to the cross. 
It must be greater than our love of possessions and property. It's got to be more. It's got to be greater than. And he says, Christ has done more than any other teacher to cement the relationships of human love. But he always asks that they should be subordinate to the claims of God. And then he says, oh, for the love that Paul had. In other words, when it's talking about, the, Jesus taught us to love one another. So again, in these, this, we've got to understand the, the, the full context of the word of God. Of course, we're to love one another. We're to love our enemy. Jesus, Jesus has done more than any teacher in history to, to exclaim that, that truth. But of course, if you're here and you go, Pastor, but that's so intense to, to, to hate, really, that's, that's, that's intense. And here, here's what you do need to know if you're new to the Bible, that the Greek word used here, missio, translated hate in English, in this passage, simply means to love less. It's still a very strong term. That's why it's translated hate. It's not like, oh, just love less. No, no, it's a very strong word. but it actually means to love less. And so Jesus was plainly saying, your love for me has got to be greater than the love you have for your family or you cannot be my disciple. The love you have for me has got to be greater than the love you have for yourself or you cannot be my disciple. And the love you have for me has got to be greater than all the things and all your possessions and all the stuff that you have and own, or you cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus was saying we're to love him first and foremost. Everything else is to take second place. Everything else we're to love less. You can, this is not new. This is not new to Scripture. You can see this all throughout out Scripture. From, from the, the Jewish Shema, hero Israel. Love the Lord your God. They, they, when Jesus was asked, what's the first and greatest commandment? He, he, he was like, hero Israel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your heart. Soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He should be First. We see this all throughout Scripture. But how does one live this out? How does, what does counting the cost look like? Well, the truth is we don't have to look too far. In the commentary we just read by F.B. Meyer, he finishes with the words, Oh, for the love Paul had. Oh, for the love Paul had. What was... Maya referring to, the cross-reference takes us to Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, where the Apostle Paul writes the following, but whatever gain I had, I counted. Here's someone who counted the cost. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I indeed Or indeed, I count everything. He's counting the cost. I count everything, everything I've got, everything I I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Another version says dung, and there's another word for dung. In order that I may gain... Christ. For a moment, let's circle back to part one of the series, Pearls and, and Pigs, and remember what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's all the apostle Paul's done. He's found the pearl. He's understood the value 
The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. We've asked the question. I don't know whether you've considered, I don't know whether you've taken a moment to go, what am I seeking? People are seeking all kinds of things. What are you seeking? Actor and comedian Jim Carrey, who has recently found faith in Christ, and you know, I, I take that with, uh, you know, with these celebrities and all that, but he, he appears to have genuinely had an encounter with, with Christ. He said this, he said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they dreamed of so they can see it is not the answer. What are you seeking? Jesus said, where do you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things we worry about and all the things that we, he'll take care of those. The apostle Paul found the pearl and he counted the cost. Everything else was, was rubbish or dung because he had found and understood the great value of the pearl. Everything else paled in comparison, was meaningless in comparison to Paul. For Paul, Christianity wasn't an add-on or a nice-to-have. It was everything. Like the disciples, Paul understood, uh, understood that, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There's no other place. You're the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. What are you seeking? We remember the words from part one of George Swinnick, who said, truly, men do not know the worth of what God offers them. The money the devil and the world offer is in their own currency and is familiar to them. Swine trample on pearls because they do not know their value. Men prefer the poor things they have because they are in their current possession. The devil seeks to pick out the eyes of men that they do not see the blessed Blessed God and the happiness that is to be enjoyed in Him. Oh, how dull is the world's glass in the presence of true crystal. The magnet of the earth will not draw man's affections while heaven is visible. He that has fed on the heavenly banquet cannot savor anything else. Jesus said, don't throw your pearls to swine. They will trample on them. But remember, men will only throw pearls to pigs because they themselves do not realize their value. Philippians 3, verse 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, Paul said, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase known as the message sums up this passage in what I think is some great descriptive language. He says the very credentials these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ, Jesus as my master, firsthand everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. That's another word for that. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. 
shouldn't say all those things are rubbish. They're, they've become rubbish. I regard them. I found the pearl. So how can we personally live this out? What, sh- what should we do? How, how, how should we live? Live this out. Well, the Apostle Paul penned these words in Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. It says, this is your true and proper worship. In the King James Version, it says, this is your reasonable service. It's your reasonable service. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 2 says, In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. Someone said this, The most common disease of our time is eye trouble. I love the words of John the Baptist. The words he proclaimed is speaking of Jesus. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. The most common disease of our time is eye trouble. He must increase, I must decrease. And so let that be true of our lives even today as we seek to follow him. I said earlier, I was talking to someone after the service. They were saying, Pastor, these are tough words. These are hard words. These are difficult words. I I feel inadequate. I feel like I just don't measure up. It's just hard. Count the cost. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. These are these are challenging. And maybe, maybe for some of you here today, you're feeling that way right now. But please understand, these challenging words are what makes us aware of how far we fall short. You can talk to people out there and say, hey, you need a Savior. What do I need a Savior for? Only when we understand our true position, our true lostness, the fact that we're sinners in need of a a Savior, only when we understand that side of the coin will we truly cry out for mercy and consider our need for it. This is what the Word of God does. These words, these tough words make us aware of how far we should fall short of, of how much we need Jesus. For the people out there in the world, they don't care. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved. Thanks be to God. It is the power of God. Why should we hear these words? Because we become aware that in our own strength, we don't have what it takes. And therefore, we can throw ourselves at the mercy of God. It brings us where? To the foot of the cross. We don't run away from Him. We run to Him. He says, come to me and burden. We burden Him with what burdens us. His his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And it's going to God and saying, I can't do this. I read these words. I realize I'm like chaff. But I desire to be wheat. Have mercy on me, O God. Not my will, but yours be done. May you increase in my life, and may I decrease. It forces us into the embrace of God, into the loving arms of our Savior. So we're not turning up like the rich young ruler going, yeah, I've done all that since I was a boy. No, we've gone, I've done nothing. God, help me, have mercy on me. Remember, ultimately, Jesus paid the price. Listen to what F.B. Meyer 
went on to say about counting the cost in his commentary of the Bible. He said, what a comfort it is to realize that God counted the cost before he set about the task of redemption. Whether of a world or of us as individuals, he knew all that it would cost and surely he did not begin what he cannot complete. The scripture says, I am certain. Being confident of this, being convinced, and, and, and we need to be convinced. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. There endeth the lesson. Come on, can we thank Jesus for paying the price for us? Thank you, Lord. Friend, if you're here today and you haven't given your life to Christ, can I encourage you? The Bible says all of us have sinned, all of us, every one of us, and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. How do we come to him? It's really just doing one another, throwing ourselves at the foot of the cross and saying, have mercy on me. A sinner, save me, God. And then seeking to live out his word in our daily life. Oh, I'd encourage you to do that. I did that many years ago. As a drug addict, he, he touched my life. And it's never been the same. Come on, would you stand as I pronounce a blessing over you? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And everybody said, amen. If you need prayer for anything, there's a prayer station off to the side. Please do go for prayer. And God bless you. The service is over. Tell someone about Jesus this week.